little button here that will allow you to subscribe and this is where my live streams will be from now on due to a guideline strike. Become a patron and give whatever amount you feel comfortable to help support my work. Just over a week ago we heard from The Intercept, prosecutors withheld evidence that could exonerate J-20 inauguration protesters Judge Rules. Chief Judge Robert E. Moore of the D.C. Superior Court found on Wednesday that federal prosecutors suppressed potentially exculpatory evidence against six inauguration day protesters. In a motion filed late last night, attorneys for the defendants accused the government of withholding evidence that could have exonerated their clients, a serious violation of pretrial discovery rules. Attorneys allege that the state withheld evidence by editing a video of a protest planning meeting. Defense attorneys called on the court to sanction Assistant U.S. Attorney Jennifer Kirkhoff for blatant hiding of evidence and requested that the indictment against their clients be dismissed. At a pre-trial hearing Wednesday afternoon, Morin agreed that the prosecution had violated the Brady Rule, which governs the state's pre-trial obligations to disclose exculpatory evidence but declined to rule on the defense's motion to dismiss the indictment or suppress the evidence. Morin will rule on those sanctions next week. The video of the planning meeting was provided to investigators by Project Veritas, a controversial far-right media group known for sting operations against its political opponents and the publication of selectively edited videos. In the J-20 video, organizers can be heard discussing plans for blockades and other civil disobedience. At one point, a speaker promises to make the inauguration a giant cluster F. At no point do they explicitly endorse property destruction. Defense lawyers say the government edited the Project Veritas video to exclude evidence favorable to the clients. And I want to stop here and point out that this news we're hearing about J-20 is pretty much only being picked up by progressive outlets. I haven't really found any larger news organizations talking about what's going on in this trial, and it's probably because what happens here is of particular interest to the activists. And I will also add there are probably a lot of people who don't like Antifa who don't really want to cover the story about how the government is withholding evidence. But it's important to point out that the intercept here is kind of smearing Project Veritas. I, calling them far right is a bit extreme. You can call them partisan, biased, but to say they're far right and controversial is kind of painting them with a broad brush, which is probably going to poison the well for the reader. But if you're reading The Intercept, you are probably of a particular slant anyway. Prosecutors have maintained that the footage redacted from the video had no evidentiary value. Kirkhoff asserted in court that the only two minor edits were made to the video. One at the beginning, when the Veritas infiltrator can be seen in a bathroom mirror, and another at the end when an undercover police officer's face appears on camera. We cut that part out, Kirkhoff said, at a hearing on April 6, 2018, and then provided everything else to the defense counsel. Ultimately, it seems that the judge agreed with the defense, and they have dismissed the charges for six more protesters. According to Al Jazeera at J20 trials, charges dropped for more anti-Trump defendants. Decision comes after prosecution faces several setbacks in trials, stemming from protests on Trump's inauguration day. On May 23rd, Judge Robert Moore agreed with the defense's claim that the USAO DC had effectively withheld evidence and violated the Brady Rule, which lays out the obligations of the state regarding potentially exculpatory evidence. Moore's decision stemmed from the prosecution's entry of an edited video provided by a far-right nonprofit group into evidence. Project Veritas, the controversial group that provided the footage, targets leftists, anti-fascists, and media outlets in investigative sting operations. During Thursday's hearings to consider sanctioning the prosecution, it emerged that the prosecution had hidden from the defense the existence of 69 videos provided by Project Veritas. And this from TechDirt. But the videos the government obtained but did not turn over the defense showed something else. The recordings, which were made by employees of the right-wing Project Veritas, purportedly show defendants discussing de-escalation tactics and their intent not to initiate physical violence with anyone unless they are attacked first. The prosecutor had previously told the judge that no recordings existed from the meetings where the newly revealed audio and videos were made. The government now says it will not use any videos from Project Veritas in the trials of the 59 remaining defendants. This gesture may be too little too late. It's also completely self-serving. If the government ditches the Veritas videos, the defense will struggle to have charges dismissed because of the government's Brady violation. 
The court may rule the violation only concerned evidence the prosecution isn't using. A no harm, no foul ruling that lets the government have its Brady violations and its prosecutions too. Hopefully, the court will take note of the government's attempt to have it both ways and deny it in full. And there are some more interesting turns in this story, but I want to stop here and talk a little bit about this. These sources are all pretty much progressive, so it's definitely painting what the prosecution has done with a left-wing bias. But all that really matters, if it's true that the government did withhold these videos, which could potentially exonerate individuals in this trial, then they should be held accountable for that. We want to make sure that justice is being applied evenly. And if there are people who are being caught up in an arrest when they had no intention of being violent, and they actually discussed de-escalation and stated they had no intention to be violent, I think it's very important that we all know about this. Because keep in mind, there probably were a lot of people in Washington, D.C. who had no intention of doing any property destruction, being violent at all, but ended up getting arrested anyway. There were also journalists and other non-masked activists who got caught up in that. I was actually caught up in that arrest and was able to get out after I spoke with a supervisor and showed my press pass. There is an argument to be made that many of the people who mask up know that individuals are likely to commit property destruction and violence, and by engaging in a black block, they are essentially aiding these people by providing cover. But I do think we have to weigh the issues here. If the government is willing to withhold evidence, that's probably not a good thing. And if they really think they're right and want to win, then all evidence should be provided so that the jury and the judge can make the appropriate decision. I do not agree with withholding evidence and withholding information. I think everyone should know exactly what happened, and then people should be able to make a rational decision based on that information. It's literally what I do for a living and partly why I do it, because I think people have a right to know what's going on. That way we can make the right choice. So even if you think these people are guilty of a crime, that's fine. Win on the actual merit of your argument. Do not withhold evidence. I would like to see more reporting on the J20 trials from people who are either actual journalists, you know, running in the center of the line and trying to be objective, or people who have a counterpoint to what's going on. Unfortunately, almost all the sources covering the Antifa trials are progressives. But there is another interesting development, and this is from Ryan Riley at the Huffington Post. On May 31st, he tweeted, Dramatic moment as the second J20 trial went to the jury. A juror passed a note to the judge saying someone had written Google jury nullification in the bathroom stall. She did. Then she told the other jurors what she read, and they talked about it. So that happened. Jury is beginning deliberations tomorrow morning. Jury nullification would be particularly powerful in this trial, as government alleges that three of the defendants engaged in some form of destruction. Unlike first case, jurors might want to convict on misdemeanors but not make them felons or expose them to lengthy sentences. Most powerful defense argument would be that this is an overreach, but defense can't really make that argument explicitly and jurors are told they aren't supposed to consider potential penalties, etc. So it would be interesting to know who wrote Google jury notification in the bathroom stall. Is it one of the jurors? Does that mean the jury is already predisposed to siding with the activists and those who are being charged with violence and property destruction? And is it possible they actually might try to nullify this case? Jury nullification is a concept where members of a trial jury can vote a defendant not guilty if they do not support a government's law, do not believe it is constitutional or humane, or do not support a possible punishment for breaking the government's law. This may happen in both civil and criminal trials. In a criminal trial, a jury nullifies by appointing a defendant even though the members of the jury may believe that the defendant did the act the government considers illegal. This may occur when members of the jury disagree with the law and the defendant has been charged with breaking or believe the law should not be applied in that particular case. A jury can similarly convict a defendant on the ground of disagreement with an existing law even if no law is broken. Although in jurisdictions with double jeopardy rules, a conviction can be overturned on appeal, but an acquittal cannot. Jury nullification is a very interesting concept because some people believe it is the last defense against government tyranny. That the government could say charge someone for smoking marijuana, and then the jury can be like, we don't think that should be illegal, so we are not going to find this person guilty of any crime, even though it is illegal. However, others feel that it gives people an opportunity to let criminals get away simply because they like the person or it's something political. 
in this instance, if there are jurors who think these people might actually be guilty but should be let go anyway, that would uh, effectively be them undermining the law for political reasons, potentially. We don't know what their real reason is. Maybe they're just people who don't think the government should have the power they do. They might actually disagree with the, the activists and protesters but simply not want to see them go to prison. But it does tend to be libertarian activists who know about jury nullification. I don't mean big L libertarian, I mean those closer to the libertarian spectrum and maybe people who think they're in the libertarian spectrum but probably